एवरीबडी आई एम डॉक्टर प्रीति आनंद एंड आई एल बी टेकिंग यू थ्रू द क्विक रिविजन ऑफ द जनरल गायनेकोलॉजी दिस थिंग द सीरीज ऑफ आर 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 एंड आई एल बी कम्प्लीटिंग अ जनरल गायनेकोलॉजी सो वेन एवर यू आर रीडिंग अ जनरल गायनेकोलॉजी चैप्टर और द मॉड्यूल मेक श्योर दैट यू कवर ऑल दीज पॉइंट्स इज वन ऑफ द वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट मॉड्यूल फॉर द एग्जाम पर्पज दे हैव लॉट ऑफ थिंग्स लॉट ऑफ क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम दिस मॉड्यूल इन योर एग्जाम so let's see first of all the very young people problems the young girls that is 6 7 8 9 years people the uh, the group of the girls who have the most common reason for reporting to the gynecological referral is basically a persistent itch or discharge now most common cause of persistent irritation vulvar irritation and discharge basically in the young girls is inflammatory vulvovaginitis it may be associated with various other reasons but this is the most common reason and most common uh, thing or the treatment for them is basically a personal hygiene which they have to maintain sometimes the people may require the estrogen therapy and because they might be using some chemicals so you have to restrict them from using that the infection may be one of the reasons so swabs are taken and they are uh, sent for the, uh, the the diagnosis the swab culture and you might find coliforms or group a streptococci may be found uh, but it is a thing which is rare and candida may be found but again it is very rare another condition can be any female any young girl who presents with a persistent long standing discharge blood staining of the undergarments greenish discharge rule out foreign body it may be one of the reasons but do remember it is not the first reason for these problems okay uh, 4% of the girls with genital symptoms may have this problem so you have to keep that in mind but not as a priority priority might be something else so make sure you have to consider vulvovaginitis as a primary cause but if anything is persistent long long standing or any risk factors other than that is present you have to make sure that you rule out the foreign body present also then coming to another problem that may be labial adhesions so young girls may have labial adhesions uh, which might be present since birth and now this usually does not create any problem if it is related with some issue then you have to sort out that issue if there is, if it is related with the difficulty in passing of urine then the separation may be required so usually uh, the general uh, measures they take place then they may require topical estrogen therapy and these things the general measures and the topical estrogen is usually useful for them however if it is not helping then the surgical procedures for uh, making the labial adhesion free may be one of may be one of the things which uh, doctor can do for them but yes uh, there is high chance of reoccurrence so as far as possible they are treated with the conservative and the medical management then some people some girls may have ambiguous genitalia the most common reason is cah here the role of multidisciplinary team is must and definitely the additional endocrinologist for the replacement of the glucocorticoids because it's related with that uh, method the process of deficiency of the enzyme so that that uh, replacement of the drugs uh, glucocorticoids or fludrocortisone is required uh, later they may require some surgical procedures for correction as well but definitely it is a role of mdd team who will take care for this do remember any female any young girls who are examined vaginally they are usually examined only and only if it is required and uh, uh, unnecessary vaginal examinations are as far as possible avoided so the most common reason for a 6 year girl to present for bleeding vaginally uh, the one episode not being very common le present or the vaginal irritation and discharge is vulvovaginitis another question which have been frequently asked in your exam is again related to the young girls either they are present with some history of exomphalus which was surgically treated and they now present with a continuous watery discharge it may be one of the reasons may be ectopic ureter constant irritation constant irritation and redness itching staining of undergarments may be a foreign body non specific or inflammatory vulvovaginitis is maybe one of the common reasons but if there is anything persistent constant then it is usually a foreign body and if the family history of presence of all the children specifically if they have a step father have the similar vulval symptoms so you have to rule out the sexual assault because of domestic violence so that part you have to take care and perianal itching the most common reason of perianal itching at night in young children is threadworm
so you have to take care for few things in young girls specifically uh, you have to know that uh, what is the process how the secondary sexual characters develop so it might be asked in your exam what is the first sign of puberty because this is a uh, this is a basic question which is most commonly related with the part 1 exam but uh, do remember the basic concept should be clear and you should know this part as well okay so uh, thalar is the first sign followed by the pubertal growth spurt the growth velocity peak height velocity and then minar within 2 to 3 years of thalar anything which occurs the secondary sexual characters if developed before 8 years of age the patient is said to suffer from the precocious puberty now the reason for precocious puberty can be many how to categorize that i'm going to talk about but you has you have to know that what is the staging of development of breast and the pubic and axillary hairs so now when they give you the questions they usually give you 17 years girl has stage 1 or 2 breast development that means it is under developed okay so that thing that uh, process you should know that if she is 18 17 she will be in the stage 4 and 5 okay so these things you should definitely understand and know from these pictures so precocious puberty if the patient comes to you if she has precocious uh, thalar and minar early onset of that then you have to assess the growth velocity and bone age if it is normal then it can be one of the isolated problem for minar you have to rule out by ultrasound that it is an isolated problem if the growth velocity is rapid and advanced bone age is present you have to do gnrh test to see the fsh and lh levels if the levels are raised it is central precocious puberty you require a cranial mri to rule out what is the condition if the response by gnrh test is flat or low that means it is a abdominal the uh, pelvic usg has to be done to rule out what is the problem at the peripheral end so it is a peripheral variety of precocious puberty similarly if adrenarch is present precocious development then you have to see again the growth velocity and bone age if everything is normal it can be an isolated problem if they are increased then you have to do the androgens level that is 17 hydroxy progesterone and dheas if they are increased dheas increased that means it is a tumor if 17 hydroxy progesterone is increased that means it is a congenital adrenal hyperplasia another problem which are seen in young girls is amenorrhea so usually the uh, am, prim, uh, primary amenorrhea by definition what we call is primary amenorrhea is something when the female is four, more than 14 and there has been no development of secondary sexual characters and no menses if the the female is more than 16 and she has secondary sexual characters but no menses then we say that they suffer from primary amenorrhea now the most important thing which comes in your exam has to be understood by the flow chart because all the questions will be answered from this flow chart so if the patient comes with primary amenorrhea the first thing what we see is presence of secondary sexual characters if they are present that means ovaries are working properly if that is present then you have to look for the uterus by ultrasound if uterus is present or normal that means there is an outflow tract obstruction so it can be an imperforate hymen it can be a transverse vaginal septum Uh, or uh, you have to further on and evaluate on the grounds of secondary amenorrhea if uterus is absent or abnormal then karyotyping has to be done to see whether it is androgen insensitivity where karyotyping will be 46xy or it is mullerian agenesis where karyotyping will be normal female that is 46xx if secondary sexual characters are not developed that means there is a problem at the level of fsh and estradiol so you have to do both the test if the fsh is high and estradiol is low that means pit ovary is at a problem hypergonadotropic hypogonadism you do a karyotyping to rule out premature ovarian failure where karyotype will be normal or turner syndrome where karyotype will be 45x0 if both are low that means there is hypogonadotropic hypogonadism which may be related with the functional amenorrhea pubertal delay primary gnra deficiency now how questions are asked in your exam you might get a scenario as i told you they may give you that 18 years uh, old girl has breast development stage 1 mostly now they are giving in this pattern so primary amenorrhea normal secondary sexual characters blind ending vagina definitely the patient is suffering from the mrkh syndrome primary amenorrhea hirsutism acne well developed breast some history of surgery in the vulval area in the past some history of uh, same sibling having this this problem takes us towards cah short heighted breast and pubic development not good and uh, she presents to you with primary amenorrhea you have to think on the grounds of turner syndrome primary amenorrhea with well developed breast but the pubic and the axillary hair are very scanty 
or they may be some swellings in the inguinal area which is another presentation but on examination on investigation ultras, uh, ultrasound uterus is absent so it is a case of androgen insensitivity so apart from the young girls now we come to the middle age group that is premenopausal ovarian cyst people so any patient who is having a premenopausal ovarian cyst first of all whether it is a benign cyst or it is a malignant cyst you divide that on the basis of the ultrasound so it is iota group which divides whether it is a benign or m so b rule follows for the benign cyst m rule follows for the malignant cyst b rule means unilocular cyst presence of solid component where the solid component is less than 7 mm acoustic shadowing is present multilocular tumor is present but the largest diameter it is smooth and the diameter is less than 100 mm and no blood flow is present whereas m rules is irregular solid tumor ascites papillary structures at least four irregular multilocular solid tumor with diameter of 100 mm or more and very strong blood flow so whenever a female of premenopausal age group presents to you by an ultrasound if you diagnose that there is a simple cyst which is asymptomatic and the patient does not have any symptoms for that so if it is less than 5 cm we don't do anything they usually resolve by them if it is 5 to 7 it is annual follow up and if it persists even after 12 months this was a question in last exam that there is a lady who is a premenopausal age group her cyst uh, her ultrasound was done and year back it was 5 cm cyst now 5 or 6 cm cyst was present now again when she have got an ultrasound done after an year the cyst is present and same size so what to do in this case we do an intervention intervention means if ultrasound is very clear that it is a simple cyst simply we will go for laparoscopic cystectomy as far as possible laparoscopic cystectomy ophorectomy you will discuss with the patient prior in hand that if there is any problem in removing the cyst because it may be endometriosis adhesion or some other reason we may require to remove the ovary but as far as possible we will do a laparoscopic cystectomy and any cyst which is more than 7 cm definitely requires an intervention in the form of surgery if the cyst is very clear by ultrasound in any of the conditions like on annual follow up of 5 to 7 cm cyst or more than 7 cm cyst if the ultrasound is not very clear is not giving any clear picture of the cyst then an mri has to be done uh, because in that case we say that usg is she's showing a cyst but it isn't conclusive to give an exact diagnosis so in that case further imaging may be required with the mri and that is an mri with contrast which they do any premenopausal age group if the cyst is a complex variety if it is not a simple cyst we do a gct tumor markers and for practical reasons we also do a ca125 levels so though though they do not support it but for practical reasons they are doing ca125 along with the alpha fetoprotein ldh and hcg do remember ca125 may be raised in premenopausal age group because of the tu- uh, because of endometriosis and fibroid also but in that case again you have to make sure that how much levels the levels are usually not more than 200 so if it is very high levels or persisting rising he- levels if you are doing the ca125 regularly and you are seeing that the levels are very high then definitely there is some problem and it requires a referral to the gynae oncologist So this patient has is 34 years old and an incidental cyst was seen when she was being scanned for renal cole. So 30 millimeter, that is 3 centimeter cyst, do not require any intervention and no follow up things should be done. In the second question, the patient has a complex cyst. So as I told you, for practical reasons, along with the GCT tumor markers, you also do the C125 level. postmenopausal ovarian cyst it is very important that whenever whatever variety of postmenopausal ovarian cyst is present in an ultrasound finding you first of all calculate a rmi index so rmi index directly as a question may come to you uh, that calculate the rmi index for the following following scenario so you should know what are the categories premenopausal postmenopausal 1 and 3 multilocular solid areas bilaterality ascites and metastasis if one of the features of ultrasound is present the score is 1 if more than one is present score becomes 3 and an absolute value of c125 is uh, taken and three of them are multiplied to give a rmi index so postmenopausal ovarian cyst of more than one or more than 1 cm in size uh, first thing what you need to do is c125 and calculate the rmi if rmi is more than 200 or 200 these patients are referred for the gynecologist ct scan is written 
and ongoing refer to the gynae oncologist for mdt care is given if the rmi is less than 200 this is a very important scenario but if the cyst is asymptomatic the patient is asymptomatic cyst is less than 5 cm unilateral unilocular simple cyst then you put the patient on follow up four to six months first follow up will be done if the cyst resolve discharge from follow up if the cyst persist then again after four to six months you will do uh, again uh, in four to six months again you will perform the c125 and tvs calculate rmi again you will call after four to six months after one year of follow up if still the cyst has the there is a problem that cyst is there and rmi some value is always there then you require to individualize according to the clinical judgment and the patient preference but in any follow up if there is any change in feature 100% these patients will require intervention and whenever intervention is done in postmenopausal age group it is always laparoscopic bilateral salpingo ophthalmotomy if rmi is less than 200 but the cyst is symptomatic non simple more than 5 cm unilot uh, multilocular bilateral then 100% without any uh, delay you have to do a laparoscopic bilateral salpingo ophthalmotomy this table is very important enmq from this flow chart 100% comes in your exam so uh, there are few scenarios the first scenario again the female is postmenopausal with a cyst of 46 mm and uh, repeat scan after 4 months shows that it is changed in size do remember if there is any change in feature we will do an intervention okay so we'll do the laparoscopic removal of both the ovaries here second patient uh, the cyst was resolved on follow up so what to do nothing discharge from follow up in this patient we will uh, there is a cyst which is diagnosed in postmenopausal by the ultrasound so first we have to calculate an rmi so we'll do a ca125 level and uh, uh, the last question is a complex cyst rmi on the higher side so we'll do a ct scan and ongoing referral to the gynae oncologist should be done but ct scan is a priority to be done first Similarly once you have calculated an RMI they also give you questions that where this patient will be operated okay so in this question the RMI is 270 so if RMI is 270 that is more than 250 she'll be referred for the gynae oncologist for an MDT care if it is less than 25 then a general gynecologist in gynecological unit can manage this patient if the score of RMI is in between 25 to 250 then management is done in a cancer center with the lead clinician cancer unit by the lead clinician the adnexal cyst is, cyst can be seen in pregnancy as well so acute abdomen mass suspicion of malignancy rapidly growing mass on follow up size increases by more than 20% cyst is greater than 10 cm all of these conditions require a surgery however if it is a asymptomatic benign simple cyst less than 5 cm no further action is taken if it is more than 5 cm or some complex features you consider but they are not malignant not suspicious of malignancy a rescan is done after 4 to 6 weeks if there is no change rescan is done for 6 weeks after the delivery and if there is resolution of this mass then nothing is done if there is any suspicion of cancer then you do an mri scan you do a tumor markers and involve the mdt team Similarly any over complex ovarian mass or ovarian cyst in children and adolescents again if it is an emergency then you have to uh, do the surgical give the surgical options but if it is not then simple cyst 3 to 5 cm follow up after 3 months 5 to 7 cm simple cyst asymptomatic rescan symptomatic may require tumor markers and mri and any cyst which is more than 7 cm simple cyst either you can do a rescan if the patient is asymptomatic or you can consider removal also and anything which is suspicious of malignancy you have to do gct tumor markers and mri along with c125 also another question which comes in exam is related to ovarian torsion so any cyst which has started uh, always specifically in the females who are of young reproductive age group requires detorsion urgent detorsion by laparoscopic mode okay even if it is purple dark colored then also detorsion is done and it is left it is seen after 2 to 3 weeks whether it is required it requires a removal and in that condition also you will do a cystectomy as far as possible and this condition is known as interval cystectomy do remember if the purple color gangrenous cyst is there again i told you you will detort but because of that cyst if the patient is going in septicemia then the removal at the same time is required 
In older patient postmenopausal patients, ophrectomy is always done if there is an ovarian torsion to remove the risk of retorsion. If there has been recurrent torsion or any female in in whom one ovary was removed passed because of the torsion, so now the present ovary has also torted. So in that case, you will detort and you will fix it. So fixation is known as ophropexy. Uh, so this patient has gangrenous cyst and because of this, uh, this patient is going into sepsis. So you can see that the temperature is very high, the TLC, C reactive protein is very, very high. So in this condition, you will not leave this ovary, okay? You will do an adenxectomy. Another condition which comes in the middle age group females is heavy menstrual bleeding. How to manage that? Usually the patient with heavy menstrual bleeding, you require to see apart from HMB, what other symptoms they have. If they have no other symptoms, then uh, definitely fasting blood, uh, full blood count will be done as a first investigation and you'll offer them LNG IUS as a first line of management. But in case if their uterus is palpable, they are obese, where the examination will be difficult, or if HMB is associated with other symptoms, specifically when you examine, you find a tender bulky uterus, then first ultrasound, then giving any medical management. And any patient of the premenopausal age group who has uh, persistent irregular bleeding, risk factors for pathology, endometrial cancer, tamoxy, she's on tamoxifen, failed medical management, you suspect by uh, the various tests, various uh, clinical scenarios, clinical symptoms she has that she ha might have a submucous fibroid or polyp, then definitely a uh, hysteroscopic OPD based hysteroscopic guided biopsy is done. And in these patients, no blind biopsy should be done. So before giving any medical management, a biopsy is must outpatient based hysteroscopic guided biopsy. So you may, these patients, whenever you are treating with HMB, you, the first line management is Mirena, second is Tranexa, NCIs or OCPs, and third is progesterone. If they are not responding, then from one pharmacological management, you can change to another. If they are not responding to anything, then definitely they may require surgical options. So if they have fibroid, big fibroids, it may require myomectomy. If it is uh, not a fibroid, purely an HMB, normal endometrium after biopsy, then ablations can also be done. And if it, the patient requires a definitive management, then definitely hysterectomy is an option. So big fibroids may require removal, specifically uh, when they have severe pressure symptoms, they are unresponsive to medical therapy or they are pedunculate. And myomectomy can be done by laparoscopy, laparotomy or robotomy. Uh, one of the very important procedures for fibroid is UA, uterine artery embolization. Uh, this is one of the uterine preservation options or you can say a less invasive surgical option. Do remember any patient who is desirous of pregnancy in future, this is never an option. And till 20 weeks of fibroid only, UAE is successful. Okay, so UAE can be one of the options before myomectomy or before hysterectomy. If the patient definitely has no contraindications and uh, uh, does not want pregnancy in future. Okay, and any patient with a big fibroid who is not responding to medical management or fibroid is in such a position that uh, it won't be uh, uh, okay with the medical management, it won't, uh, the patient may not be okay with the medical management on, on resolution of fibroid. In that case, myomectomy is only procedure, any only surgical procedure which gives the best evidence of fertility after removal. So if a patient has HMB uh, and she has taken NCIs and Trenexa, which are definitely not the first line, she has a history of thromboembolism, so definitely the doctor might have not given her OCPs. So the best option for this patient is LNG IUS. Uh, patient has menorrhagia and uh, there are some mucus fibroids basically and uh, her family is completed. She had tried Myrinocoil which hasn't held her. Two fibroids are present, some mucus, mucosal fibroids are present. So best thing for this patient will be hysteroscopic myomectomy. Now, a third scenario is a 48 years old lady with a fibroid and large uterus up to 12 weeks. She, Myrena tried but got expelled and she wants to save the uterus. So this is the best scenario for doing a UAE. And uh, any young girls, uh, young patient who has fibroids where uh, they might have the definitely uh, uh, HMB might be helpful for uh, with the medical management, but for the fertility purpose, uh, uh, 
मेडिकल मैनेजमेंट इज नॉट गुड बेसिकली सो दे मे रिक्वायर द रिमूवल एंड द एज आई टोल्ड यू माइमेक्टोमी इज द बेस्ट वन द बेस्ट सोर्स द बेस्ट एविडेंस इट गिव्स फॉर द फर्टी फ्यूचर फर्टिलिटी and uh, the last patient requires a uh, definitive management she has been given some sort of medical management but her hemoglobin is dropping so you will do a gnrh and she has a fibroid so you'll give a gnrh meanwhile for recovering the hemoglobin level reducing the size of fibroids to make sure that the blood loss during the surgery is less postmenopausal bleeding is another one problem so postmenopausal means after one year of complete amenorrhea patient presents with the postmenopausal bleeding so first thing what we do is to assess the endometrial thickness if it is 4 mm less than 4 mm it's okay if it is more than 4 mm then hysteroscopic guided biopsy should be done but please remember if the uh, endometrial thickness is less than 4 mm you will discharge from follow up but if there is a recurrent bleeding that patient will require a hysteroscopic guided biopsy similarly if endometrial thickness is less but she carries a risk factors for endometrial cancer that patient also will require a hysteroscopic guided biopsy one of the reasons for hmb and postmenopausal bleeding can be endometrial hyperplasia so endometrial hyperplasia another very important topic for em qnr exam so endometrial hyperplasia without atpia is known as eh with atpia is known as atypical hyperplasia so endometrial hyperplasia without atpia the lng ius is a first line management you will keep on doing a surveillance of endometrial biopsy every 6 month and if two negative biopsy come after 6 months after two negative biopsy that is one year follow up complete follow up two negative biopsies are there then you will discharge the patient from follow up if the patient refuses coil then oral progesterone can also be given as a second line management any patient who has used lng ius and her bmi is 35 and above or any patient who refused lng ius but used oral progesterone so these two category of patients if the bmi is 35 and above whatever method she has used or if the patient was treated with oral progesterone these two patients after two negative biopsies done 6 months apart will requires at least an uh, uh, annual biopsies for review okay you will now discharge them from follow up after two negative biopsies annual biopsies need to be done any patient with endo atypical hyperplasia the first line treatment is surgery laparoscopic hysterectomy with bilateral salpingectomy for premenopausal and bilateral salpingohorectomy for postmenopausal in case if they want to retain the uterus for fertility purpose lng ius can be given every 3 month you will go for the biopsies as soon as first negative biopsy comes you will send them to art center for pregnancy once the pregnancy process is complete you will do the surgery some patients want to retain the uterus with atypical hyperplasia not for fertility in them you have to you can give medical management but every 3 monthly you have to do the endometrial biopsy and after two negative biopsies every 6 to 12 month endometrial biopsy should be done please remember whether a patient belongs to endometrial hyperplasia or atypical hyperplasia if after one year of follow up anything persist that patient will undergo surgery this i have told you whenever you are doing surgery it has to be postmenopausal you can remove both the tubes both the tubes and uh, premenopausal you have to remove both the tubes ovaries you can preserve uh, so these are the questions which are related to the same what we have just talked and pms uh, yes pms questions sometimes they ask you related to what is the first line of management so uh, usually the conservative management is the first line management with pms uh, what is the first line pharmacological management it is continuous use of drosperinone containing cocs now if there is a scenario where the patient has uh, symptoms which were not controlled by cbt so when they have given cbt that means the patient more was having more of psychological symptoms so whenever you are offering them the medical management you have to give them ssris okay if they have received cbt means there means there is a lot of psychological symptoms so not giving them prosperinone containing cocs as a first line these patients after the conservative management will now require ssris like in this case and menopause and hrt so menopause is always a clinical diagnosis in patients who are less than 40 or in their 40 to 45 with the symptoms where you are suspicious that it can be menopause then the two fsh levels need to be done 4 to 6 weeks apart to confirm so if the level should be more than 30 to confirm that it is a menopause 
and what to give menopausal ladies re- require the hrt therapy as a primary one oral is a preferred one because it is beneficial it is beneficial in various aspects it is more rapidly more available it is cost cost effective so these are the properties where the oral is basically preferred transdermal is preferred specifically if there is patient preference or there are contraindications for oral use and vaginal you know for the local symptoms you can use vaginal therapy so the transdermal can be used for the patient preference poor symptom control with oral they have gi problems there are side effects with the oral there are restrictions to use oral because of risk of stroke or vt or hepatic enzyme they are on some enzyme inducers so these are some conditions or lactose intolerance if they have so these are the conditions where oral is not used now uh, generally how do we use uh, the hrt therapy so any patient who has a complete amenorrhea of one year now comes to you for the menopausal symptoms deepthi deepthi yes ma'am yes i'll start again from this slide okay 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 you can just stop once so how do we start the uh, hrt therapy according to the age groups okay so if the patient has complete amenorrhea of one year so preferably whenever you are giving hrt it is a continuous combined hrt which should be given in case if the hysterectomy is done then continuous estrogen replacement therapy can be given now if the patient has not achieved the complete amenorrhea she is still having menses or irregular menses and she has a menopausal symptoms because if because of which you are giving her hrt in those patients sequential combined hrt can be given uh, in young one okay who, who did not have the one year of whole amenorrhea then uterus is not there then estrogen replacement therapy alone is enough if uterus is there always a combined estrogen progesterone has to be given okay these are some questions which are related to very important thing that is if the patient is a breast cancer survivor and has menopausal symptoms then what do we give them so we know that hrt we should not give any patient is a breast cancer survivor whether she is on tamoxifen whether she is not on tamoxifen ideally the treatment of choice for menopausal symptoms is clonidine if she is on tamoxifen like in first question and clonidine is not an option then venlafaxine snri can be given because it has a least drug interaction with tamoxifen ssris have high drug interaction with tamoxifen that is why we don't give tamoxifen uh, ssris with tamoxifen in breast cancer with the menopausal symptoms with tamoxifen the treatment of choice will be snri because clonidine is not an option second question is not the patient is a breast cancer survivor again the treatment is clonidine but clonidine is not there and here tamoxifen use is not there so either ssri or snri anything can be used so ssris are usually preferred so ssri is the answer and uh, breast cancer survivor with the vulval vaginal dryness ideally they should be first given the moisturizers and if they are not responding then topical estrogens can be given because topical variety of estrogen is still okay systemic absorption is less so it is okay with them but try to resolve the problem with the moisturizers so thank you so much everybody i hope this uh, rrr session from studymatic helps you all so it was a general gynecology uh, review a short revision variety by me dr preeti anand mentor from studymatic thank you so much